So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to extend a warm, a warm welcome uh, to all our attendants, both in person and online, for join us, joining us uh, for this lecture. I to have the distinct on, honor, honor of uh, hosting uh, prof Associate Professor Ingvar Mellet, uh, an expert on ancient history from the Department of Archaeology, History, Cultural and Religious Studies at the University of Bergen. So our, our enthusiasm for tonight's event is amplified by Professor Mellet's long-standing connection to our institute. So we would like to uh, grasp this or take this uh, moment to express our uh, appreciation and gratitude for his uh, friendship and commitment to the Institute for uh, all these years. Professor Mellet's research primarily centers uh, on the social and political history of the ancient greco roman world, as well as the reception of classical antiquity. Currently, he leads the use and reception of classical history research group at the University of Bergen. His research and publications can be categorized, in, cat categorized into three main themes. The political history of ancient uh, Greece and Rome, with a particular emphasis on the socio political dynamics and structures of oligarchic and democratic regimes. Uh, the intricate, su intricate subject of patronage uh, in the ancient world, and the role of women in religious and socio political contexts, including the study of female cults in antiquity. Tonight's lecture will delve into the intriguing topics of oligarchy and democracy. Professor Malem. And of course, over wine at the end. So let's get down to it. Uh, when it comes to oligarchy and democracy, we cannot talk about the one without the other. Nonetheless, for uh, over 100 years, uh, studies of democracy has flooded the market, whereas explicit studies of oligarchy uh, has been very, very scarce. Uh, there might be good reasons for this, uh, as, we, uh, as, as we're going to address shortly. Scholars have, of course, they have discussed oligarchy, but more or less always in the context of Athenian democracy, uh, and of course, in specialized articles. This has changed quite recently. And I'm going uh, first to say a little bit about the works that have preceded my work, and then tell you who I have a beef with. Let me see here. All right, then. The first full monograph uh, of Olga Keys was written by Leonard Wibley in 1896 uh, and uh, was called The Greek Olga Keys, Their Character and Organization. And it can still be used today. It's not that dated. Uh, then we had to wait for another 100 years with Martin Oswald's Olga Kia uh, at the Steiner Verlag in 2000. And then Trumpets and drums. Matthew Simonton in 2017, Classical Greek Oligarchy. Um, the Martin Oswald book was mostly uh, centered on uh, the politics of Aristotle and, of course, uh, the Athenian politeia, whereas Simonton's work uh, is the most comprehensive treatment so far uh, of both the theory, theory and practice of oligarchy. It is outstanding. Nevertheless, I disagree. From the other side of the continuum, we have uh, Rick Robinson, uh, who has uh, focused on democracies outside Athens. Uh, his first book, The First Democracies, Early Popular Government Outside Athens, uh, that is uh, mainly uh, for the archaic period, where he finds evidence here, there, and sometimes everywhere. Uh, and the second one has to do with the classical age, and it is perhaps mostly the, the last book I am going to discuss a little bit. Uh, but what he has done is to free us from the Athenocentric view of democracy, and that has uh, expanded our understanding of both systems quite, uh, quite uh, extensively. Yeah. Let me see here. I'm doing stupid stuff with this thing now. So what is the gliding scale model? It is built on the comparative historical tradition introduced by Aristotle. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a tool to make variations in the institutional setup uh, more explicit. 
uh, and with that, uh, characterize the resulting systems with more precision than before. Not just moderate or radical demo uh, uh, democracy, moderate or strict oligarchy. A little bit more finesse will be possible if we look in detail about the variations of the institutional structures in the whole Greek area. Uh, the point is, is that we find uh, democratic features in oligarchies and vice versa, which makes it complicated. Even in Athens, as we are going back to, we will find oligarchic features which uh, existed throughout uh, the democracy's history. So the model will help us avoid falling into the trap of using single scraps of information for various polis uh, as, as confirmation of this is either democracy or an oligarchy, the labels uh, are secondary to my research. And we should be very careful about this, which I will say Eric Robinson has not been, at least in the first democracies. We're getting back to that too. I have used early versions of this, as I told you, in two case studies. And I have as a handout, just to show you how it works, uh, printed out the, the model applied, again, in an early version, but the model applied and uh, for Tegia, which has also been published. And um, what you can see is, yeah, we go, we, we are going to address this a little bit more in detail later on. We are not going through this. I just want to show you how it works. For instance, um, we divide things in democratic and oligarchic traits and often something in between. We have the general sources of various political systems, and then we have the particular sources to the system under discussion. And as you can see here, there are so many holes here uh, for the specific um, specific uh, sources for Tegia, which makes it that much harder to conclude. But enough preamble. I'll begin the discussion of the methodological basis of the model uh, before I move on to the model itself. Firstly, we have Aristotle, and he is the main source for the general part of the model. He does uh, give us information about particular systems as examples, uh, but he doesn't, in politics, treat uh, them separately. He shows the variations in institutional setup. He doesn't tell us stories, full stories of each system. Mm -hmm. And they all often seem disconnected. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this was done by his pupils, which wrote 158 politeia, or stories about constitutions. And by chance, we found in the, we, we didn't, 100 years ago, they found uh, the, uh, the Athenian politeia from the sands of Egypt. So that's the only one we've got. So firstly, Aristotle does indeed discuss a lot of constitutional variations, which he connects to specific polis. Some of his generalizations are very philosophical and moralistic, fanciful even, uh, but after all, they are inter interconnected with this larger empir uh, empirical project that was going on at his school in Lycaon, as we see here. Um, and um, he's going to be, um, he will be the major source uh, among with a few other sources for the general picture of uh, the Greek polis institutional setup. That's my first point. Secondly, in its essence, um, comparative method, as we're using here, requires generalizations. Uh, and we can say that all explanations re um, is a good comparison. We explain something by comparing it to something that we know something about. Uh, and uh, if we're going to explain things, we have to use our own concepts. You may perhaps think that's obvious, but um, Many scholars do not. They insist on just using the Greek concepts for Greek things. And that doesn't really explain anything, and it is not possible then to get it on the same formula. 
comparative method is just it's not uh analogy use the use of analogies we use analogies all the time with uh, in scholarly literature and in day-to-day -day speech uh but this is not it uh we can't say this is oh we found this piece of evidence and it corresponds to another piece of evidence we can't say that because we don't know the context uh, a comparative method is a systematic analysis of similarities and differences between related phenomena, phenomena such as, of course, the ancient city-states that we are discussing today. So if we want to do more than just quote the sources, which is fun in itself, we cannot escape making abstract states, statements and, um, uh, and uh, invent our own uh, language to or concepts to uh, explain uh, the polis phenomenon. phenomenon. That means that our categories, and I have a lot of categories, they um, will not fit 100% with every Greek polis that we find. And there are also intermediate uh, concepts, and so, sometimes uh, um, particular institutions and practices fall within all the chairs. But I have, as you see, uh, seen on the handout, a lot of chairs. So hopefully, uh, each polis will find uh, so. So that's the method. Then comes the how I position myself uh, in relations to other uh, scholars. Uh, and I said in the beginning that uh, uh, the demarcation between oligarchy and democracy is, in my view, connected to the institutional setup for the polis and not so much in slogans. I think both Robinson and Simonton are, are too much, uh, too much involved with slogans and culture. Uh, both sides in the political conflict uh, said that they wanted not to create an oligarchy. Nobody wants to create an oligarchy. They might want to create a democracy. But the constitution of our fathers. And I think that uh, the Patros Politeia, the constitution of our fathers, was indeed the main way that people in the different polis, like Tegia, uh, defined their system. They didn't define it, I can't of course prove this, but I think, I think they didn't define it in terms of oligarchy and democracy before it became a revolutionary issue, like a political slogan for change. Uh, um, I said uh, the regime of Demetrius of Phaleron in Athens is a bad example because he came to restore the parts of Politeia, uh, which he didn't, uh, and his oligarchy was quite blatantly oligarchic, uh, and it didn't really last. He didn't convince many Athenians because they had already a very proud tradition of democracy. But Athens is not typical. And that is, uh, I think, a very important lesson. We can't extrapolate from what we know from Athens and say this was typical, uh, even for democratic uh, cities. There were so many variations, and so many didn't bother to define themselves on as oligarchies or, or democracies in the first place. So, uh, so again, uh, we are going from the institutional to the constitutional from the details regarding the uh, assemblies, councils, and offices to the labels and not the other way around. Now, this will better reveal the fluidity of political systems as we find them in Aristotle's, poly Aristotle's politics, among other things. Fourthly, uh, constitutional labels are not very precise. And those who rule, the rule by the few, um, they have a plethora of names for themselves and also for the system. They are the best, the rich, the best again, the good, the beautiful, the noble, and the excellent. And of course, if you talk about aristocracy, you say that it's not a meaningful, meaningful description of a political system. The meaningful description is oligarchy, because there were always the few, and there were always the rich. And they all, all of them thought that they were excellent 
are noble and beautiful. At least beautiful in the soul. <laughs> uh, same with the uh, formulations where you find demos in it. Uh, it could be a literally literary um, uh, sources, but also epigraphic sources. And again, Ergovicin is my is my main uh, is my main um, adversary here. Uh, where he finds uh, these inscriptions, but also also mass summit uh, inscriptions where there's demos, demos did this, demos did that, then of course it must have been a democracy. Uh, but also oligarchies tend to think that they are the demos. Uh, we the people, even they were not the total, uh, even they were not the total um, uh, amount of, of citizens, they were only those who had a certain wealth. So, um, also, the lack of precision. We will find uh, elite councils uh, with the rich and the accomplished, even in Athens, like the Alpagos Council, which is, a, to say, an oligarchic remain. Uh, and, but we will find that in most democracies, because the, the, the elite council was first, and then democracy, if it came, came later. And they rarely uh, abolished this institution. So the existence of that does not automatically mean that we are talking about a democracy. And um, vice versa, um, if you find, uh, find um, a people's council, like the Council of 500 here in Athens, which goes back to, you have the Council of 400 and the Solon, and then you see that it can easily coexist also with an oligarchy system, that when we, we go, we, when we develop Athens, or Athens develop itself to a democracy, it is, uh, so, uh, it's suddenly uh, a very important part of institutional apparatus. So what I think is that moderate oligarchies in some form or another was the default position in ancient Greece. And democracies that required a, a more institutional and ideological ingenuity. And here there's a, a difference between American scholarship and uh, European scholarship. And of course, the Europeans here. Um, and we, we are right, of course. Uh, the Americans, at least many of them, the most the most famous of them are uh, see democracy everywhere. And I think, I don't know why, I think it has to do with, they call their own system democracy. And it certainly isn't. It's a sort of oligarchy. And then, <laughs> I, I, I'm just speculating here, but it, it's noticeable. But if you, if you for instance, Josiah Uba, he uses uh, the Athenian experience to inform uh, present politics in America. And he's one of the big shots in uh, American scholarship on ancient Athens. Um, and he's also moved from the uh, classical department to the political science department, uh, or did, I think he's uh, retired now, and um, has used a lot of political science concepts and abstractions to make this happen. So I think there's an ideological component here and not just a scholarly uh, difference of opinion. I think that informs it. But for instance, Paul Cartledge, he uh, agrees with uh, that it starts out at oligarchies, most systems are oligarchies and democracies, at least uh, in the classical age, uh, is rare after all. And certainly non-existent in the archaic age. Then we have the final triumph of democracy all over Greece in the Hellenistic period. Um, and again, we are Europeans, and we have often thought that democracy ends with Alexander III. Uh, I agree that it did not. It continued here in Athens with variations. Uh, but again, um, here, the, the labels are very much confused. What, what If a system calls itself a democracy, 
Uh, in the Hellenistic age, it's not necessarily a democracy. Uh, but again, um, my friends over there, um, they claim uh, the Hellenistic period as the triumph of democracy because there has never been uh, before so many systems, not only in mainland Greece and the islands, but also uh, in the Hellenistic empires. Uh, a lot of examples from, from um, uh, Asia Minor, uh, which call themselves democracies. So yeah, it's not the Athenian kind, but Athens does not have a monopoly on democracies. That is That much is clear. But uh, uh, German and French and uh, uh, English scholars, and sure some Greek ones too, uh, think that these democracies only use the label of democracy and are really uh, and are really a, a sort of oligarchies, where the oragetes, as they're called, the, the benefactors, uh, monopolize the offices, they monopolize the council, and they monopolize the debate. Um, in the People's Assembly. They keep the People's Assembly, but it's much more elite-dominated than what we find in uh, the Athenian democracy. Um, I would say, therefore, that uh, the elite in the Hellenistic period they found that they didn't have to exclude the poor from the system, from the institutions. They didn't have to exclude them from the Assembly. They could just follow the advice and did follow the advice of Aristotle. He gives advice on how to maintain and create an oligarchy. And furthermore, the most supreme office is also, which must be retained by those within the constitution, that is the oligarchs, must have expensive duties attached to them in order that common people may be willing to be excluded from them and may feel no resentment against the ruling class because it pays a high price for office. And it fits in with that that they should offer splendid sacrifices and build up some public monument or entering upon office so that the common people sharing in the festivities and seeing the city decorated both with votive offerings and seeing the city decorated yeah, blah, 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 with buildings may be glad to see the constitution enduring. And an additional result would be that the notables would have memorials of the outlay. And of course, you recognize the Lysicartus monument. And you could say, well, the, the liturgists in Athenian democracy, they were rich, they put up monuments, and they dominated, if they wanted to, the political debate. Or at least they had, had an extra oomph when they uh, rose in the 70s because they were known. The difference here is one, if it's voluntary, uh, and with no ties to political power, or if it's obligatory with ties to political power. So, for instance, when you when um, Demetrius uh, uh, made an, uh, created his oligarchy in Athens, he shut down the liturgies and uh, had the agonetes and other officials, which were elected, uh, organize the choruses. Uh, and um, and um, sports events. So we tie what we call community patronage to offices. While it's a liturgy system was based on, you just, it's a form of honorary tax of the rich and not something. And, and you had to do the, your liturgies whether you uh, wanted political office or not, or was interested in politics. So that's a different, but we'll look further into that as we go along here. So, how do we start systematizing this information uh, about constitutional details in our sources? Mostly, Moses Finley, he uh, presupposed in his politics in the ancient world that there were some constants in the flux of social and organizational variations in a vast number of Mediterranean city-states. There were much variation, but there were some constants within it. Now, this has found strong support in the results of the Copenhagen Police uh, Center, uh, which uh, picture here, it's a very thick book, which organizes all the information we have on constitutional matters and size of population and ter territory uh, of all the known city-states. I think it encompasses 
1,500 uh, something uh, six or polis in the archaic and classical world. So, whatever city state we study, we will most likely find three key institutions the People's Assembly, elected office holders, and a um, permanent elite council. So the existence of an assembly does not mean that we have a democracy. Most oligarchies had that. All these, uh, all of these can pronounce judgments in, in uh, criminal cases and civilian cases, but uh, when you come, uh, when the police reaches uh, over a few thousand citizens, they added a fourth, which is also very common, the courts or jury courts. Uh, they were led by magistrates, but they used large juries to decide things. And these institutions varied uh, greatly, uh, not in its existence, all, all seems to have them, but in the relations of power between them. That's number one. And number two is uh, who can participate? Do you have to be rich, very rich, just well off, or can even the poor participate here? Uh, in, um, we also have in fully developed democracies two additional institutions. Of course, the uh, one of them is the annual People's Council. They are elected or sorted through lottery for one to two years. And um, even in oligarchies, I told you about the Salonian uh, pe uh, People's Council, uh, they function as, uh, have a proboletic role. They, they, they function as organizers uh, of the uh, agenda in the People's right. Assembly and discuss among themselves propositions. So it can coexist in the oligarchic system, at least open oligarchic systems. It's only when it usurps power from the permanent elite council here or a progress council that we can get a democracy. Because uh, traditionally the, the permanent elite council has this uh, the overseas of the constitution. They can even, in states like Sparta, uh, veto the motions uh, and decrees uh, uh, in the assembly. So uh, a people's council is, in conclusion, a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition for democracy. Without it, the rule, the rule of the elite is absolute. A much clearer mark of democracy is the boards of officials appointed by lot. And we know of them from several places. Um, most uh, famously, of course, Athens, but also Syracuse. It went from uh, a politeia, as Aristotle says, to a uh, democracy with uh, the introduction uh, after it's a little uh, war with Athens uh, of lottery for the lower uh, officials. Not, of course, the generals. That would be suicide. So if we uh, if we got one of these, we most likely have a democracy. Yeah. Mm. So the population in the Greek polis fell into three basic categories, the citizens, uh, the free resident aliens, and the young free slaves or helots or what have you. The citizens were the privileged part of the population. They owned the land, they fought the wars, and they voted and participated in the People's Assembly. So uh, in every city-state, we find a very close connection between the citizens' economic status, or uh, resources, the social status, their military obligations, and their political rights. In addition to the elite cavalry of the knights, the hoplites uh, are recruited from those who can arm and provision themselves. And um, you do not have to presuppose that they were very rich. It wasn't that expensive to get hoplite armor and get a few, uh, few weeks, uh, a few weeks uh, provisions. Um, so they constituted the military strength through the uh, hoplite phalanx or infantry. 
um, of the city. So they had a higher status and more political rights, at least in the beginning, than the what we can call the sub hoplites. They had many names, uh, different polis. Uh, the point was that they were too poor to arm themselves uh, as hoplites and train themselves as hoplites. But what varies, of course, is where is this division? In Sparta, it was very high. You had to be a wealthy landowner to be a hoplite and a full citizen. In uh, Athens, it was pretty low, uh, according to recent studies. And um, of course, in Rome, uh, they they started using everyone uh, in order to um, uphold their empire. The sub um was used in in uh, in light armed infantry, slingers, archers, rowers, um, but they did not have the same share uh, in in um, the political offices or the prestige of the hoplites. That didn't mean that they were unimportant in battle. Quite contrary, quite the contrary, uh, they um, the greater mobility and greater uh, range of their weapons made them indispensable. And um, you know the shield down at um, uh, down at the Agora Museum uh, from the Spartans at Pylos. Uh, that was after the the. Uh, the victory over the Spartans, uh, which uh, was uh, facilitated by mostly the sub hoplites, the slingers and the archers. They were the ones who subdued the Spartans by raining uh, missiles on them. So, but they had less, less prestige, even though they were more important, sometimes at least. You also have to, which is something that's been introduced uh, quite recently by Van Wees. Uh, we have to distinguish between leisure class hoplites and working class hoplites. And uh, the Sagitai of uh, Salonia and Athens were probably leisure class hoplites. They didn't have to work for a living. If we see, uh, if we see the, the um, um, property requirements to be a Sagitai, it's much too high to uh, be, uh, be able to include enough hoplites for Athens to survive uh, attack. So this is the first part of my revised model. And um, I'm of course not going through it. It's uh, probably impossible to read, uh, but of course it's based on my earlier work in Tegia where you have a handout. And I already talked about uh, the main divisions uh, in oligarchy trades, democratic trades, a lot of things in between. Uh, uh, and um, the, you could say that only the exclusion of the poor from a popular assembly is a 100% secure sign of its classification as an oligarchy. Most systems had a little bit of both. Other traits are less obvious. I've said this, so I shouldn't say it again. Uh, again, we can't go through all the stages in this model. Here's just number one. I think there's six, seven. But I am going to talk to you about, in more general terms, uh, six main types of variables. First, the division of the free adult male population. We've already talked about this. Uh, they had different names. Hippies in Greece, Equites in Rome, uh, Hoplites, and again this with uh, the lesser class Hoplites, Sevita in Athens, and Homoioi in Sparta, first class centuries in Rome. That is not to say that um, the property requirement of Sevita were the same as Homoioi and the first class in Rome. Uh, but there is a there is a, um, a range of variation here which is quite similar. And we have the working class hoplites. So well-off theaters, they are not some hoplites. They are not all running around with arrows or, or, or applying the oar uh, in the fleet. They are also serving as hoplites, the well-off among them. But 
we find that so we find them both among the hoplites and among the sub hoplites. So the portators in Athens is among those, the Hippomionis in Sparta, the, the inferior ones, uh, and Protari in Rome. And again, these divisions had it's a lot of variation because you could be quite well off and still be Hippomionis in Sparta. That's uh, the you know inferiors who couldn't pay their mass dues. The mass dues were uh, uh, a recent a recent um, uh, study by Figuari or Figurari uh, shows that there probably was eight could support eight people at subsistence level. So it's quite high. Then you had, of course, to provide for yourself uh, and your family. Uh, and, and many people fell out of the system that way. So the poor intators and the Hippomionis in Sparta, they're both sub but at a very different economic uh, level. So the, these things go together, and that's part of the part of the argument. But the importance of property requirements uh, also require a separate uh, a separate point here. Um, where uh, is it applied? Uh, is it if it's for lower offices and people's council? Uh, we have a problem because on the books, as I said earlier, Athens maintained that you have to be a sogita to serve in the people's council and the lower offices. Aristotle tells us in, or his student in the uh, uh, Athenaeum Politeia, tells us that this wasn't practiced. But still, this is a democratic society, uh, an even radical democratic society. They change the laws all the time, but they don't change this. They just don't practice it. It's very strange. And I think the ideology of elitism coexisted with the more again egalitarian um, uh, ideology in Athens. So and then we have, of course, the major offices where it doesn't really matter uh, if you have to be a knight uh, to to be elected because the people would elect them anyway. Very seldom uh, there is. Uh, any example, they, they lower the threshold down to Sugitai, but the generals or stratego we know of, they were all from the knights. So that didn't matter much. And democracy of Athens, they continued to elect the elite to the major offices. They thought even thought that election itself was not democratic, but oligarchic or aristocratic. Then we have the question of participation in the assembly, and I marked that in bold letters, because that is clearly the thing that is oligarchic. And we have several experiments, uh, the 5,000 and the 9,000 on the first oligarchic revolution, and uh, the 3,000 for four. This is during the Peloponnese, during and after the Peloponnesian War. And we have Kunon after the death and, uh, of Alexander. And the network so low with it. One thinks that these thousand drachmas as um, was effectively um, um, an answer to that two thousand drachmas was too much. So, and we also hear that the tits, a lot of the tits, uh, were excluded here and and went abroad, found new land elsewhere. So. If I should make a guess, possibly a guess, I would say that 2,000 drachmas excluded too many hoplites, and that the 1,000 drachmas threshold only excluded the some hoplites. It was a reaction to it. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, feasible to exclude, at least on paper, so many fighting men. And again, the Homo era of Sparta, we already talked about, they were clearly uh, wealthy landowners. And the Centuria in Rome is the same principle, but applied to group voting. 
Now we have the Juris, of course, uh, and Athens. Uh, it's, um, Aristotle tells us that uh, opening the Juris to all citizens was the most democratic of Solon's reforms. Uh, whereas in oligarchy states, we find that the Juris also are uh, mainly um, uh, controlled by the elite. Now we have the manner of participation in the assemblies. And then I presuppose that we deal with systems that where all native females can participate. That itself doesn't mean that it is a democracy. We only know if they can't, it's an oligarchy. If they do, however, participate, it's not yet a democracy. Let's hope it becomes a democracy. I'll show you why. Several things happens in uh, the assembly, apart from assembly. This, by the way, is a reconstruction of, of uh, the, uh, you can see what it's a reconstruction of. Uh, it's very, um, I haven't found the author yet. It's just floating around on the internet, um, but it's, uh, it's very good. So proposals. In Athens, they had, during the democracy, um, you could, uh, the People's Council propose things. Uh, you could get uh, motions from the floor, which was sent to the People's Council, and then put in the agenda the next um, the next uh, assembly meeting or whatever it suited the, the agenda. Um, the rhythm of the, of the different assembly meetings. So, so we can have an uh, open, Assembly, but as long as the office holders or the Senate or Arapagos Council or Gerusia uh, are the only ones who can make these proposals, then you don't have a democracy. And again, that's something the smart, uh, the smart uh, oligarchs, the Roman oligarchs, found out very early. They monopolized this and kept monopolizing it through their. Republic for 400 years. Then there is debate, okay? Only they, certain people can, uh, certain people can make proposals, but who can debate? Again, uh, in Athens, we find that everybody can, and in other systems, only the elite. That again, doesn't speak well for a democracy, but it does, it does, um, point towards which particular kind of oligarchy we are dealing with. And that is also important. Then we have voting. Now this is perhaps not the most crucial point because whoever shows up in the assembly in Greece, it seems that they have equal voting. So the rich, uh, the rich hands in the air uh, count as much as the poor hands in the air. And Rome, of course, they have different uh, versions of it. Um, also, secret secret voting. That's we don't know much about it. Possibly, likely, perhaps it was used um, uh, when the uh, when they were electing people, and of course with the ostracism. But for decrees and laws of various kinds, it would open. Um, so that is not a defining uh, characteristic, but interesting. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I left you in the air there. Because um, a major part of the so called democratization of Roman politics was introducing the secret ballot. And that had to do with people not being, uh, not being, uh, um, to prevent people being bullied by the aristocrats or nobility to vote in a certain way. So secret voting was a way to make it more democratic. Whereas here, the open voting points towards this bullying not being part of the deal. So if they have secret, secrecy can be, depending on circumstances, uh, a key uh, feature to explain a certain system for us. That's very cool. Then, as I told you earlier, uh, the power relationship between institutions is uh, of paramount importance. Um, 
The first one is, of course, can the elite council, the permanent council of lifetime members, veto the assembly? Yes, sir. Uh, another reconstruction from the Grusia in uh, in Sparta. Uh, we can also we can also say that the Arpagus before Solon seems to have had that voting right, and possibly also after Solon. Depends on how democratic you think Solon actually were. Can the annual People's Council decide on their own? That is a sort of indirect democracy and seemed to be a rarity in Greece. But again, Aristotle, he tells us about uh, an older form of democracy, as he told us, tells us, uh, in Mantinea, where they elected a People's Council. Uh, three, four, five hundred members, I'm not sure, uh, who did all the, made all the decisions by themselves for a year, even for two years. Um, and that is, of course, our kind of system, isn't it? But it didn't, doesn't seem to be the normal way to go about it. But it exists. But Aristotle says that the more that is left to the council, of course, it's better because he was an elitist, uh, the more oligarchic or, or the more moderate uh, the democracy is. So his ideal mix of oligarchy and democracy, he called just called politeia, which isn't very helpful. Um, he, he stipulates that the people does not constantly go to assembly meetings. Yeah, in Athens it was 40 times a year, and they leave more to their elected officials and, of course, the People's Council. And, of course, controlling the office holders through audits and day-to-day -day interaction. And again, we have different ways of doing it in, in uh, Athens. The annual People's Council can do it, jurors can do it, assemblies can do it, or they can do it in 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 any sort of combination, whereas this is left to the elite permanent council in um, oligarchies. Election or lottery. Should be all together. Um, higher office holders are of always elected, um, but not exclusively. Um, because during the democracy, the strategoi, the generals, the ten generals, were the effective military leaders, and a lot of what the old nine archons did was sp spread around on other officials and assemblies and councils. Uh, so what they did was that they elected 100 to be archons each year, and then they drew, drew lots about who was supposed uh, who who um, was actually Archon. So that was a, a mix of election and lottery. Very strange. Low office orders, often lottery, but doesn't have to be. And juries, of course, but whereas the ancients thought that uh, elections were uh, elections were uh, primarily an oligarchic tool or aristocratic tool, we find lottery in oligarchies, but then between the oligarchs themselves, in order for them not to be, um, uh, um, not to, to end up uh, killing each other. Because for an oligarch, and this is something that Matt Summerton explains uh, brilliantly, for an oligarch not to be chosen by his peers is an insult. So when you introduce lottery, this insult disappears, and they don't have to kill each other which is a good thing if you're an oligarch. And lastly, there's a lot of points here, uh, community or collective patronage, where the pat patron or community patron, they, they're called erogators, well-doers, um, gave gifts to the whole community. And our pictures here of, of some of them we have here, uh, the, uh, the comedy of Aristophanes, uh, I think it's Lysistrata in a modern version. Uh, in the mirror, they still um, they have uh, 
resurrected uh, the use of the stadium. They even, I think, go around and they don't uh, run naked, but uh, at least in Greek style costumes. Uh, and of course, the triarchs uh, maintained and supplied a warship. We also have special commissions. We have Demosthenes bragging in a in a law case that he uh, a court case that he had financed uh, re uh, rebuilding or reparations on the city wall. Uh, his uh, adversary was not impressed. But that's another matter. So these were these were not connected to offices. They were voluntary. In form of liturgies, all right. What happens uh, in Olga case is that these expenses are connected to office only, as uh, we, we saw from advice by Aristotle. And again, what finds them in Hellenistic democracies, uh, post classical Sparta, and of course in Rome. Then I shall conclude. And again, hard to see, I guess. Is it, is it possible to see back yeah. there? It's possible. Wonderful. Um, I, so far, I have uh, been able to identify these kinds of oligarchies. We have the closed oligarchies, and we have the competitive oligarchies. Those are the main, main, um, main types. Then we have a lot of subtypes. Domestic, dynastic oligarchies, where one family has all power. Nobilities, where you have a multitude of noble families that compete for power, like the Opatrids of Athens, patricians in Rome before the the uh, uh, the well, yeah during the early Republic, and plutocratic oligarchies, where the rich, in virtue of being rich, control the institutions. Uh, there we have, of course, the oligarchs in Athens um, and Rome under Sulla. Democratic oligarchies are among the, what do we call the competitive oligarchies? Yeah, not open oligarchies. Political rights are, uh, are graded by wealth, but it um, but not, uh, but the sub hoplites, uh, well, the sub hoplites are excluded. So only the rich are eligible for offices. Then we, of course, have Fokion, so we talked about, and the Messios of Falerans oligarchy here in Athens. Then we have open oligarchies. I, I mix them up with competitive oligarchies uh, in the beginning. Um, and that, I think, is the normal way to do it. Only the rich are elected to offices. But even the poorest have voting rights. Whether or not they are able to debate uh, in the assembly, um, propose, it's not that important. Um, because uh, the elite council defines the agenda and have a position that is much more elevated than, for, for instance, uh, a paraclass or or Kimon or I'll say this here in Athens. I think this uh, is the Salonian, Salonian uh, system in uh, uh, here in Athens. Uh, Paul Cartlidge uh, does not. He thinks that uh, the the system uh, during or after Solon was democratic because subhoplites or the Tets were excluded from the assembly. He thinks. I think that's a too radical view. I think they were not excluded. But I think that Hellenistic democracies could more, more better be characterized as open oligarchies, along with the Roman Republic and Tegea, uh, which was my conclusion uh, on the paper that I wrote about that years and years ago, and which you have the model for in the handout. Yeah. I shall stop now. Thank you for your patience. Uh, it was a bit, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> anyway, let's have Q and A.
Thank you for this, this very insightful uh, lecture. So, who wants to start with uh, Renee? Yeah, yeah, Professor, uh, uh, a question. When do you think that the, the so called mixing the political system mm -hmm. was the first that they arrived? When I was first. Uh, was the first, uh, uh, there was a first uh, elaborated uh, the theory of the mixing the yeah, mix system, but, uh, mm. had a first theoretical elaboration. Mm, yeah, uh, that begins in the fourth century, I think, but um, possibly before, but we only hear from it from Aristotle onwards. Uh, and it's, of course, systematized by Polybius. But Aristotle, he talks... He mentioned that the mixed constitution mm -hmm. is in the air, and that it is debated. So exactly when, but I think uh, you could say, um, yeah, perhaps from Thucydides. Say from Thucydides, he talks about mixed constitution. Mm -hmm. But if it begins with him or not, uh, we don't know. But not much before him, I think. May I give a hint about it? For an elaboration before to see this uh, mm. uh, around the so when he, mm. he, he gives uh, he speaks of the famous debate mm. in the court of Persia between monarchy mm. um, aristocracy ah. uh, oligarchy but aristocracy yeah. and the democracy basically he suggests uh, a compromise in the middle in the, in the way eh? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, basically, they choose between the different systems. And the is, I think he agrees that monarchy is best for a big empire like Persia. But he is sympathetic to the democratic form, not the mixed form, the de democratic form. Um, and he tells us that when the Athenians ado adopted uh, democracy, they became much more powerful because they defended their own freedom and not the privileges of the few, uh, and even the time of the sisters as uh, such. So I don't think the mixed constitution was something that Herodotus uh, was uh, arguing for. But we may, I may be wrong, more often wrong. Thank you. Other <laughs> person? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, if you have uh, at the end of uh, the lecture, you can progress to the types of oligarchies and you develop the similar thing for, for democracies. Yeah, I have, but I'm, I'm not happy with that. Mm -hmm. So that will have to wait for. Um, I did some preliminary categorizing for Tegia and, and Sicily and Syracuse, but. I think it needs to be further refined, and I hope to be able to do that. Uh, do you have, have any ideas for me, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll be grateful for it. Right? But mm -hmm. there is forms of participation. And of course, mm -hmm. Matinea is an indoor form. Uh, you have the federal systems, uh, where there is a sort of, um, you say there's a sort of at least it can be argued that they have a sort of uh, representative democracy there. Ah, I don't know. But uh, Jakobsen, uh, in his um, federal, uh, he has a representative government in ancient uh, Greece and Rome. He argues that the federal states like the Italian League uh, were such uh, representative democracies. But I have to look into that. And then you have various forms of, you have plebiscitary democracies, where they don't really they delegate a lot of stuff, or a lot of stuff is delegated from them, uh, which is more perhaps usual, uh, but they they are sometimes asked to vote for stuff. Uh, um, we have plebiscitary democracy during the um, under Napoleon III, when, when called them into to vote, but of course also Hitler had it, Mussolini had it, doesn't make it a box, but still. And, and various forms, of course, various... Um, I will try to categorize different democracies 
um, about uh, in, in accordance with how much competence each of the institutions have. Not so much about the rights of the, the individual citizens, because let's say they have rights, but the, the uh, and also how, how many times there are uh, called to assembly uh, each year. If it's five, that's one form of democracy. It's four is a completely different kind of democracy. But I'm not there yet. Yeah. Any Two questions, um, mm. they're not related, but never mind. Uh, first, in your introduction, you were saying that, um, like you pointed out, they're quite evidently democracy has mm. been discussed and categorized a lot more. And you were hinting that you that there are reasons why, mm. which you haven't really elaborated. But that's the first one. The reasons why what? I, I hear, why, I hear. why democracy has been discussed so much more. Yeah. So that's the first one. Yeah. Second question. Um, I seem to remember that Aristotle is particularly graceful of Mantinea. Mm. And I can't remember why. Can you write? Uh, I can find the source, um, yeah. but not right now. Uh, if you give me, uh, give, me, give me your email address, I can find the source and send it to you. I don't have it right now. But um, first questions first. Uh, that's a good way to go. And uh, why uh, so much? democracy. Well, it started out, I think, um, because they the the, um, the elite didn't like democracy. Didn't like it. So they used it to denigrate uh, Athens uh, as, um, as um, popular majority dictatorship, uh, whereas Rome was uh, a bit better, because then the elite had more Power. They had assemblies, but they did control them, so it wasn't so bad. Um, then um, democracy became something, so that's the early uh, early days, so to speak, the early modern, uh, or early modern period. And uh, also in the early, uh, in, in, during the, also during the Re Renaissance, actually. And, uh, the Age of Enlightenment, Voltaire, the soul. They weren't that keen on Athenian democracy. But then, with, uh, you could say that our system, our democracy, was born in Philadelphia, uh, in the USA during the American Revolution. And they, their democracy was, they didn't use democracy because democracy was bad. The people had too much power. Um, but the 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 bad taste of democracy. Yeah, democracy was the system that uh, killed Socrates. So not so good. But then democracy became something positive. Uh, de Tocqueville uh, in the eighteen fifties uh, wrote his Democracy in America, and uh, but still, uh, democracy uh, was not still not rehabilitated, so to speak. Then they found the Athenian politeia. Yeah. And, and, and before they thought of democracy in the terms of what Tacitus told about the stupid Christians, <laughs> the panic, the easily uh, persuaded and gullible masses of Athenian democracy, the bad guys that are that exiled, of course, um, and uh, uh, mostly Plutarch, uh, his, uh, his various uh, biographies, uh, of course, when, where Pericles is, is good, because as Thucydides says, uh, under his rule, it was more a monarchy than a real democracy. So that's cool. And also, um, we have uh, Plutarch's, Plutarch's um, description of the ostracism of Aristides. Uh, you may not have heard about it, so I can tell it to you who don't. Um, he was... Uh, he was in, in, in danger of being ostracized. So he went down to the Agora, like everybody else, to, um, I don't know who, which name he wanted to uh, write, we, we don't know that. But Pericles tells the story that he was approached by a, a, a simple farmer, you know, uh, and he was illiterate, and he asked Aristides if he could be so kind as to write uh, on his ostraca. 
Yes, says Aristides, of course. Which name should I write? Aristides, the farmer says. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, but may I ask what, uh, why? Uh, what has Aristides done to you? Nothing. Uh, he doesn't even know who he is, which is quite clear at this point. But he's so tired of he hearing him being called the dust all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, Aristides goes for 10 years in exile. Um, oh, so that's uh, the kind of stories that they read uh, before the Athenaeum Politeia. And then scholarship takes a different turn. But suddenly we see that this lack of obstacles and constitutional refinement that we had thought about this mass democracy who did whatever they liked or, or, um, whenever uh, it isn't it isn't correct they have a lot of processes they have the people's council what they do they have different uh, types of of cases that, that they discuss in the different uh, different uh, assemblies during the year and so forth it is not a crazy system also in Athenae and Politeia, uh, we find that the archons each year swore to upheld the existing property rights, not to redistribute the land. And that is, of course, the typical democratic thing is to kill the rich and redistribute the land. But here, every year, the archons swore not to. But then, perhaps... I think democracy isn't too bad after all. And so this couple, this scholarly thing, and and, and the more popular thing, that uh, democracy uh, has become not a word for direct democracy, but it can include indirect representative democracy, makes it more palatable. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the, in the early 20th century, the masses get the vote. So democracy is a good word. Even though the elite controls most, most of the things for a very long time. That was a long winded answer, but I have been long winded in my lecture today. So, so you're used to it. <laughs> for us Greeks, it is hard to swallow uh, the hard. Uh, uh, narrative of uh, Thucydides mm. that Athenians slaughtered the millions. Mm. I found uh, the narrative of uh, Thucydides not convincing. Mm. I believe the exchange of uh, arguments must have been different. Mm. It's impossible to be to have been thus cynical. Mm. What is your opinion about? It? I think they did it. What? I think they did it. Uh, I think they are quite cynical. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, if Tucidius lies about this, which he seldom does, one thinks he can control him on. You don't have other sources to support the other view. So yes, I think they did it. They did it. But that's also a part of Erbisa Blanca, part of the Greek self-definition. Hmm? Uh, for instance, I've heard uh, Greeks tell me that the Spartans didn't really kill babies, which they didn't find uh, sufficiently fit, because they ha haven't found the mountains of, of um, uh, mounds of, of uh, skeletons, baby skeletons. And of course, they may be right, uh, but it is a part of the Greek self-definition. That reasons to them, and and even the Spartans weren't too bad. So, yeah. But uh, to qualify that, also um, non-Greek scholars um, have demythologized the Spartans on, uh, and made them less strange and peculiar. So this is side, both sides of the thing. Safety to their any person to go along. Oh, there are some. 
we cannot hear the speaker. Yep, but we don't have any questions. But uh, I have one, if I oh, may. Good for you. Yeah, good for you. My, so uh, oh. I find the uh, gliding scale model mm -hmm. a fascinating tool, mm -hmm. uh, both methodologically and uh, independently. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yes, I, mean, I think you're right. There's a greater variety than mm -hmm. just oligarchy against uh, the democracy. Mm -hmm. And my question refers to the results of your ongoing research. Mm. Uh, like uh, all these subtypes, let's say, or variation types that you came up with uh, as a result of uh, your ongoing research, do you see any patterning on these different variations? Like, do you see, for example, the plutocratic oligarchy mm. have a specific, uh, like, regimes with, mm. with, let's say, this specific variation? Patterning in clustering in uh, specific places for specific uh, mm. uh, periods. In time. Well, oh yes, I think the plutocratic oligarchy is mainly in the classical era um, because they had they, they seem to have different kinds. You know, the nobility, the dynastic oligarchies, they seem to also in the classical era, but dominate the archaic era. Hellenistic era, not so much plutocratic oligarchies. None I haven't seen, yeah. anyway. But then again, we don't have many literary sources that describes them. It's mostly, if there were plutocratic oligarchies in Hellenistic age, we will not know anyway, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't write that in an inscription. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so we can't really know, but I, it's not like I think my hypothesis is that the oligarchs got a little bit smarter and branded it, labeled it democracy, and kept on as before the small variations, the small, small adjustments. This reminds that's my me. cynical. This thing. reminds me of something. <laughs> what this reminds me of something. <laughs> Ah, I think I think it is not uncommon in uh, bureaucracies and modern, modern politics. Any other questions? Oh, in this case, we can call it day and thank you very much. Well, we can have one. Thank you. And we can continue with the reception. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.